Welcome. It's great to have all of you on today's call. Let's uh, go ahead with the remaining chapters from the book of 1 Peter. We had completed uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, and today we're going to pick up 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, so I would like to begin with a word of prayer. We'll then go into reading the entire chapter, explaining it. And similarly, we will try and do chapter 4 as well in today's uh, session. So we'll start off with the word of prayer. Could one of us open up with prayer, please? Maybe I'll pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. I thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace, your kindness, and your goodness that is following us throughout uh, this day, Lord. And God, I just give this class into your hands right now. We ask for good Wi-Fi connections. And God, I pray that you will help us to understand uh, every single thing that Pastor Nancy teaches us uh, and also to um, store it and treasure it in our hearts and mind uh, so that we can shine bright for your kingdom. I give all my classmates into your hands. Be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jafina. Uh, as we have seen, the book of First Peter began with uh, Peter reminding the believers about their spiritual inheritance and their true identity in Christ. And the fact that though we are here in the world, we are actually representatives of heaven and that we must live a life which is, uh, you know, which is holy, which is... Uh, a, a powerful and a victorious life. And in chapter 2, we saw how he calls the community of believers as a chosen generation, you know, as a, a holy people, as a special people unto God. And God has done this. The result of being the special people is to praise God, to proclaim the praises of our God. So time and again, there are reminders about who we truly are in Christ Jesus as individuals as well as a community and of course you know he uh, is preparing the heart of the believer to to live a righteous christian life so he says that once walk should be such that uh, you know we we uh, are different from the world if we are just like the world and we indulge in uh, uh, gratifying our fleshly desires there's nothing special you know, about us anymore. Uh, we are called by God and so we must represent God well with holy living. And uh, he is speaking to the believers to have the right attitude in a time of persecution. And uh, so uh, while talking about it, he also talks about submission. So we saw he spoke about submission to, to masters where he said that uh, one must be committed to uh, the the person that they work for and uh, uh, if at all you know there are some instances where uh, even unfair treatment is meted to uh, us we must trust that god will turn everything around for our good and uh, because of our faith in god you know we keep going forward and he uh, taught us about the example of Jesus and he said see Jesus also suffered and uh, it was not it was not a right kind of a suffering because he never deserved that suffering uh, however the patience of Jesus the trust of Jesus on on the father enabled him to go through that suffering and come out victorious so he gave us the example of Jesus and told us that even in times of uh, unjust suffering we still have the assurance of God's uh, uh, reward in our lives so with that we had stopped now we are coming to chapter 3 let's go ahead and read the whole whole uh, chapter and then we'll go ahead and uh, explain it out so there are 22 verses 11 and 11 verses uh if two students can please read you know it'll be helpful for us to explain first peter chapter 3 verse 1 
Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. We can have another person read the remaining uh, verses. Should I continue? Uh, or just I, you can do it. <laughs> Uh, we can just hold on if someone else on the team wants to read. That would be nice. Okay, fine, Jeffina. Let's go ahead, please. Yeah. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will, who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who rival your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for good, doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, and once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now says is baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. Amen. Thank you, uh, Rosalind, and thank you, Jeffina. We'll go ahead and see uh, what these passages are conveying to us. So as we start out here, 
uh, with uh, chapter three, verse what? We see the context of uh, marriage. And uh, earlier we saw that uh, Peter was saying, submit to the uh, masters. <laughs> Excuse me. And now, in the context of marriage, he's speaking to the wives. Even Paul wrote about husband, wife, relationship, and the covenant of marriage. Uh, we look at this in um, Ephesians chapter 5, where he talks about the relationship between the husband and the wife, which is, uh, which is emulating the relationship of the uh, of Jesus and the church. So Jesus is the bridegroom, and the church is uh, is the bride. And the way the Lord Jesus actually loves his bride sacrificially, uh, he talks about that, Paul. And then he also goes on to say that, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to the wife, right? There is the aspect of submission to the husband. So that is a requirement in the marriage relationship. So here, Peter also has some instructions. Uh, so in Ephesians chapter 5, it would be verse 22, where uh, it is said, wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Uh, and and you know the the rest of it. So here again, Peter is talking about submission of the wife to the husband, and he says, uh, "Be submissive to your own husband." So notice both of them are saying, "Be submissive to your own husbands." That simply means that uh, this this uh, instruction of submission is specific to the marriage context. So to say that you know every woman has to come under a man. Uh, uh, is not is not accurate because sometimes we we see certain uh, standards that are set where it is said like you know let's say there's a woman preacher if she's married it's okay you know her husband is her authority but if she's unmarried then there is a force for that woman to come under the submission of male uh, only under like you know uh, male leaders because you always need a man as a covering for any lady. So it's not talking about, you know, like any lady. It's talking about a wife. And very clearly it says, wives, submit to your own husbands. So it, it does not mean that, you know, all women are to come under uh, men in that sense, you know, in terms of uh, submission or covering. So it's in the context of marriage. And then, uh, we also notice here, he talks about the conduct of a wife. He says, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. So there is an importance on godly living. So let's say, you know, that uh, 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 a husband is, is not in the Lord. Now, looking at the, the wife's life uh, can make a positive impact on the husband and he can actually come to the faith. So there is that much power in the uh, conduct which displays God, the marriage context. And so, you know, wives are being encouraged to have a righteous conduct, have a holy and a godly conduct. And then he says, uh, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, uh, there is a possibility for that husband to come to know the Lord. And now there is something about adornment uh, and i know in our culture the world that we live in today there is so much emphasis on appearance and uh, grooming and uh, you know adornment and so as believers as christians what is it that this passage is talking about so when we read through the the passage there is a, a, a specific specific things that are pointed out. So it says, do not let the adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So reading this passage in some 
uh, places, there is this understanding that the Bible is actually telling us not to have any arranging of hair or don't wear gold or don't wear fine apparel. Like one must be very sober uh, looking in appearance and clothing uh, uh, for women. Well, does that what it says is, is something we must examine? You know, if it says so, then yes, that can become a rule for everyone. But if that's not exactly what it says, then we have to be a little careful. Otherwise, we will come up with, uh, you know, a regulation uh, which will bring people uh, under, uh, you know, you could say like, it, it's never easy, right? Like when you put those, those boundaries and say, no, all women do not uh, uh, you do any arrangement of the hair or do not wear gold or do not wear any fine apparel. Uh, so very clearly he says, let not the adornment merely be outward. Meaning, yes, externally there are things that you know women generally do, but he says what is more important is the spirit or the inner person or the heart of the person. Now, heart of the person, what is the emphasis that he places here? He says, uh, the characteristics of a quiet and a gentle spirit. Gentle and quiet spirit, what does it mean? Gentle means humility. So when we look up those Greek words uh, from uh, where we can get the meaning, it means humble, humble. So having a humble spirit, Right. And quiet spirit. What is a quiet spirit? Quiet spirit has to do with calmness or stillness. Uh, how can one be still unless they are trusting in the Lord? You know, they're not anxious, but they are trusting in the Lord. So he's saying the things that can uh, beautify us from the outside are nothing compared to a character or an inner person who is humble and who is trusting in the Lord. So he's saying that is more important. He's not saying the other things should not be there at all. But he's saying, let the prioritization be correct. So you give more importance to the inner, inner person. And then, of course, you know, any form of external adornment that, uh, you know, women may, uh, women may do, like uh, what he has stated here. So ultimately, it's about the spirit or the inner person. And then he points out to other godly women. So in verse 5, he says, For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husband. So notice, he is pointing to people like uh, Sarah. He'll come to Sarah and he says, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. So the quality of Sarah that he is pointing out is that of submission to her husband. You know, she was there by his side when he had to journey out of his own uh, land and, you know, he had to trust God uh, for the promise of God to be fulfilled. So she was with with Abraham and she was uh, that supportive, submissive wife. So he's pointing to that and he's saying, look, we can learn from Sarah because in that marriage relationship, she was faithful. She was committed. She was submissive to her own husband. And it says she called him Lord. What does it mean? You know, are women supposed to call their husbands Lord? Uh, well, we must understand it in its context. So it's talking about honor, placing honor on the husband. Right? So uh, the wives should honor their husbands. And Paul talks about this. Uh, and uh, similarly, you know, though he's not pointing, Peter is not pointing to the role of a husband and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of what they need to do. Uh, of course, there's a little bit uh, coming up later. We must understand it in its context. So he, Peter is mainly talking about submission, submission to authority, submission to masters, submission to husband. Uh, and, you know, that's the right form of living. Now, here again, to just help us understand, when we talk about Sarah, you know, in the Old Testament, we know that Abraham was very rich. And also, we know that uh, when it came to uh, the culture, of their times and marrying of girls, what they would do is they would hand over jewelry, 
right? So they would give a lot of jewelry and other things. Uh, when the girl, like Rebecca, when we read about all these people, they had, uh, you know, external adornment. And you know, we also see, like, you know, Sarah was very beautiful uh, when Abimelech saw her. And, and so the point that, you know, we're trying to make is we are not being told that external adornment in any way will, uh, you know, make us unholy before the Lord. Uh, because we should not go by the thing of, hey, you should not wear gold. Right, at least here, that's that's not what Peter is saying. He's saying, whatever you do on the outside, uh, it's it's nothing compared to what must be done on the inside. So there is a prioritization kind of language that he's using because he's also taking the example of Sarah, who actually wore jewelry. So then, how do you explain, uh, you know, re uh, regarding jewelry? So it, this is all to do with attitude, character, behavior conduct uh, and, and then he speaks to the husbands uh, so he told all this to the wives and now he's telling the husband to live with the wife with understanding there is a beautiful uh, passage in proverbs 24 verses 3 and 4 it says through wisdom a house is built and by understanding it is established by knowledge the rooms are filled with pressure with all the precious and pleasant riches so how can a family be built how can a house be built god is giving us the blueprint and he's saying to in order to build a family there needs to be wisdom there needs to be understanding and that's what peter is speaking about right now he's saying look husbands you want to have a family you want to uh, uh, you know raise up a household then you live with understanding with the wife so if there is no understanding that becomes difficult i mean this is part of you know your marriage course we won't get into that but since peter is talking about it here I'm just making a mention, the importance of understanding in a marriage relationship and, and a marriage covenant. And you know, he's also talking about giving honor to the wife. And Paul talks about you know loving the wife in uh, Ephesians chapter 5. So while there are duties or responsibilities of the wife towards the husband, there are also responsibilities of the husband towards the wife. So it's, it's like when both are doing their part, it becomes so much easier to establish a godly family. So the importance of understanding, the importance of the wife submitting to the husband, the husband honoring the wife. And it also states here, weaker vessel, the wife as a weaker vessel. So what does it mean? See, weaker vessel does not mean that when it comes to salvation, God discriminates between the, gen uh, between the genders. We don't have any confirming reference anywhere else that there is some Thing different about the inheritance or the power or the authority, the position that a woman has in Christ as compared to uh, uh, what a man has in Christ. Because the same Peter, he says later on, as being heirs together of the grace of life. So he's saying that God has given equal spiritual blessings, spiritual uh, inheritance to both the uh, the man and the woman, but weaker vessel, then how do we explain weaker vessel? Uh, it obviously has nothing to do with the spiritual aspects. So weaker vessel could simply mean physically when we compare the ability to, uh, uh, you know, the compare the strength, the physical strength. And it's quite obvious that in general, you know, we can always sit here and argue that, oh, there are women who are stronger than uh, men. But in general, physical abilities of, of men, uh, you know, capabilities to stretch themselves physically is probably more, you know, as compared to women. So it's just the physical aspect that he's making a comment on. He's not saying, when you say weaker vessel, spiritually, he's not saying that God has two different um, uh, you know, like uh, 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 positions for the genders, male and female. So that's a little bit about the marriage context. Uh, any questions, thoughts before we go further into the chapter?
um, yes. a question that so when uh, we see in this verse that uh, that your prayers may not be hindered, does it mean uh, sometimes the prayers will be hindered when uh, maybe the husband is not being responsible or the wife is not being responsible at family? Uh, would that be a reason for some of our prayers uh, to be hindered under the context of family? Yeah, thank you, Jafina. Sorry for my oversight. I had to speak about it, but I somehow missed it. So it's saying to the husband here, mainly, not to the wife, to the husband, that you, one must a husband must treat the wife well and live with the wife with understanding. Only then prayers will not be hindered. So it is what it says. So let's say a husband is not treating his wife well and uh, he's not giving honor to the wife and there are issues answer is yes his prayers will be hindered so it's pretty dangerous even spiritually uh, is, is what peter is saying so something for uh, husbands to take seriously and of course you know the wives have to do their part All right, so if there are no additional questions, we'll just go to the next section here. So now coming to the context of uh, uh, Christian life and brother brotherly love for uh, uh, others in the body of Christ, he calls the believers, uh, he says, be of one mind. What is one mind? In the context of home, he said, have understanding, all of husband and wife. So when it comes to the family of believers, one mind means agreeing together on the core matters, you know, our faith, uh, then uh, uh, righteous righteousness, holy living. We are all in agreement uh, uh, about these matters. And when we are having one mind, it helps us move together. It helps us flow together. So there are no divisions among God's people. So one mind refers to that. And what are some other uh, characteristics which make for good fellowship? He says compassion. Have compassion for one another. So when there is compassion for one another, obviously there'll be lesser quarrels because you know we are thinking of that other person just the way we consider ourselves. So. He says, uh, having oneness of mind, compassion, love as brothers. So having love for uh, each other. Let me just quickly look up this word uh, love here. Okay. Charity. Charity, the NKJV. Yeah, so interesting. I was just wanting to look whether it says filio or does it say agape. So it says agape, So which is God kind of unconditional love. Have unconditional love for brothers and sisters in Christ. And usually when uh, the term brother or brethren is used by these, uh, you know, these apostles in their writing, it refers to believers. Uh, yes, we can take it as family members, but it refers to believers. So other believers, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous. All of this is, you know, to consider the other person more than us. So that's the point. And then he says, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Uh, so what does that stand for? It means competition. Avoid competition or avoid bitterness of heart, jealousy, envy towards other people. No, avoid those things. Uh, on the contrary, blessing. Or we wish well for people around us. Uh, and why do we do this? Because uh, we were called to this. God called us called us to this kind of a uh, you know a blessed fellowship and. Uh, uh, also, blessing for our own lives. All of us have been called for blessings. And because we realize that, we go ahead and we uh, we extend, whether it is compassion or love or uh, tenderheartedness towards our brethren. I mean, imagine if we actually do what Paul is, uh, Peter is saying, uh, it, it 
it is like heaven on earth. Uh, so that's how our fellowship should be, uh, as far as you know these apostles are concerned. And he says uh, there is a, a point here. James spoke about the tongue, the power of the tongue, and how it can be so damaging. Even Peter says, uh, you know, anyone who loves, if you love your life, if you love good days, then refrain his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. So being careful with our words uh, is a requirement for us as believers. And there are obviously blessings that come from uh, the right words that are spoken by us. And uh, he also talks about righteous living. He says, turn away from evil, do good, seek peace and pursue it. And he says that our God is faithful. So in verse 12, he says that when we live a godly life like this, and when we pray to God, right, we are maintaining a godly life, right attitude towards family members, right attitude towards uh, church believers, then what is the uh, advantage of that? He says that when we pray, God is open to the prayers of the righteous. So when we have the right kind of uh, 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 lifestyle, right heart attitudes, uh, our prayers are heard. Okay, Our prayers are answered. Now, we may have this question of when it says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Doesn't it mean all those who are saved? Yes, of course, it means all those who are saved because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But there's always a truth about us living out that righteous life. I mean, imagine a believer who is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but living an unrighteous life. Would that be a hindrance to his prayers or not? It will be. You know, a sinful life will hinder our prayer life. Uh, and so we can also say, that walking righteous, living righteous is necessary for our prayers to be effective. Uh, and now he talks about enduring suffering, even if it is uh, unjust, right? Unjustly, when we are we are treated, uh, he says, uh, "You need we need to be strong and uh, know that as long as we are doing the will of God you know, and we are suffering for that, it's a good thing." Uh, so we we always say that there these uh, persecution like experiences that people have opposition that people have as long as it is happening because we are doing the right thing it's fine but imagine if you're doing the wrong thing and then we call it persecution you know the Bible can doesn't uh, you know encourage that the Bible is saying you do what is right and if at all you're facing problems because of doing right, then don't worry. Because even Jesus suffered uh, unjustly and uh, you too will be able to overcome this. So from verse 13, he says, uh, whenever you know uh, we suffer for righteousness, it is, it is good. Take it in a positive way, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. So when we suffer for righteousness sake, we are blessed. Don't be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Why is Peter saying this? Because remember we said persecution was already existing, but a greater level of persecution was anticipated. More is going to happen. Then when more happens, then what? how are we going to face it? And uh, to help the believer orient themselves for the... Uh, for the rising persecution, he's saying, keep doing the right thing. And when we are doing the right thing and persecution happens, just consider yourself as blessed. Okay. And he also says that uh, people are watching us and people may have questions. So they may come and ask us. Right? They may ask us um, and uh, they may want us to speak about our faith and to defend ourselves saying what we believe in is uh, unto the Lord and it is not, uh, you know, rebellion against the authorities or it's not rebellion against man. So when we have to explain these matters, he says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. What does it mean? It means to consider God as holy. Consider God as holy in our hearts, right? And it could also mean 
consecrating ourselves and living a holy life so we have come we are committed to holiness and sanctification so we are living a righteous life and we are also capable or we are becoming capable of give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you so being able to explain our faith people may ask you know so jesus died what does it mean can we explain it so this is what the work of the cross stands for people may ask you talk about salvation explain it to be able to explain salvation means this this and you know the other so being able to explain what our faith is about is a necessity for all of us as believers how are we going to get to that place when we ourselves are growing in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ so being able to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you and he also adds there with meekness and fear which means when we are presenting our case or when we are presenting our views we do it with humility we do it with uh, a godly fear you know there there is a thin line sometimes we can start arguing with people sometimes we can start putting people down sometimes we can display arrogance right by competing with them and challenging them oh your faith is like that my faith is like but what is peter saying he's saying look it is important to explain our faith but carry the right attitude it's not for the sake of competition it's not for the sake of uh, you know putting someone down it is for the sake of revealing christ so that hopefully they will also understand and they will come to know our lord jesus christ to so do it in an honorable way uh, now in in some places this passage is uh, taken up and uh, the the ministry emphasis is only on what we call as apologetics give a defense you know, keep giving a defense for everything that uh, unbelievers are questioning us about well it is correct we should give a defense but uh in in some instances it can go to an extreme where people say that uh faith christian faith is only about giving defense and uh, there's no <coughs> excuse me connection to the supernatural but let's think for a moment is that what peter is stating that only keep giving defense this is the same peter who was at the gate beautiful peter and john who saw that lame man rise rise up so giving a defense along with the other aspects of ministry where we are demonstrating the power of god is uh, you know it's the complete picture so the supernatural is also a part of revealing christ to people not just us giving you know verbal explanations to people but also the demonstration of the power of god because that's the kind of ministry peter himself did and how could he be saying that one shouldn't have a supernatural uh, element or uh, you know uh, part to the work of the ministry so that's about you know explaining to people or you know a, a, apologetics uh, that we speak about now coming to the next uh, section over here it talks about baptism and it very beautifully explains to us that baptism uh, is is not what gives us salvation let's see it says having a good conscience that when they defame you as evil doers those who revile your good conduct in christ may be ashamed okay hold on yeah later Uh, verse twenty one, right? So good conscience. Uh, okay, good conscience. The reason why I connected it to baptism is you have the scripture over there, which again says, "But the answer of a good conscience toward God." Okay. So baptism. How does water baptism uh, uh, help us? It does not remove the filth of the flesh. Verse twenty one. So it doesn't make us saved. but once we are saved we 
declare our salvation or we declare our faith in Christ through the act of water baptism. And it says good conscience towards God. That means, see, when can we have the right conscience towards God? When we are obedient. If we are disobedient, our conscience will, will prick us and there will be conviction. You know, conviction of the spirit working in our hearts. So good conscience has to do with obedience. Now, obviously, we know the command of Jesus was to be baptized in water. So it's a step of obedience that every believer must follow. OK, uh, it's not a requirement uh, to to be saved, but it is a command where one Every believer must obey that, that command. And uh, when we do that, we will have a good conscience towards God because we have been obedient. So over here in verse 16 also, he you know he talks about good conscience. So sorry, I just connected that to the baptism. Um, so having a good conscience that they when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. So basically he's saying, we give a defense with the right attitude. When we do that, then uh, those who are watching us and listening us, listening to us also will understand that we are coming from the right place. They'll have nothing to accuse us and you know prove that accusation uh, later on. OK. And then he says, it is better to suffer uh, for doing good than doing evil. And then he talks about the Lord Jesus. He says, even Christ, he suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So he's talking about both the sad part where Jesus died, but then he also was made alive. The happy part where uh, he rose from the dead. And we see the victory of our Lord. Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, notice he is now making a reference to uh, what God has done in punishing the disobedient. So till now, he's giving instructions and he's saying, live by it, do the right thing anyway. It's better to suffer even if, uh, you know, for doing the right thing. Now, what if people are disobedient? So he's uh, giving us the example of uh, the spirits in prison. Okay, so Jesus he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient. When once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. So what is he saying? The reference is back in Genesis six. So many of us know uh, over there, uh, the Bible talks about the angels of God, you know, uh, uh, having sexual relationships with the daughters of men. And that was forbidden that uh, even in the book of Jude, you know, he talks to that. It's rebellion where God has given spheres and uh, boundaries within which our authority lies. What did these spirits do? They actually disobeyed God and uh, they rebelled against God. And that is not pleasing to the Lord, right? So that is not uh, something that uh, is accepted. Instead of that, obedience is what God is looking for. And then, you know, while talking about it, he uh, talks about uh, Noah and the his family in the ark. And in that context, he says they were saved through water. So saved through water uh, what does it mean you know we can we could say that god protected them uh, even though they were in the flood it's a huge flood and god protected them from there he's just making a connection uh, to ba water baptism right water baptism and uh, the experience of noah so noah was in the water you could just put it that way noah and his family was in the water and they were saved so similarly, when we are baptized, it's a proclamation. He's also clarifying that that's not what brings you salvation, but it's a picture of us being in the water. You know, and uh, uh, the way Noah and his family were saved, we now have salvation. 
and then uh, towards the last the conclusion he says now jesus he is in the uh, he is in heaven at the right hand of the right hand of god and he talks about the authority of the lord jesus and he says angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him so that's uh, from uh, first peter chapter 3 uh, i trust that tomorrow we should be able to complete chapters 4 and 5 uh, and then we have only one more uh, book to go which again is very similar to the book of jude first uh, second peter uh, and and so you know that again should be very easy for us to complete so i'm hoping that uh, yeah next week we should be done with all the uh, chapters so any thoughts or questions based on what we have learned today please let us know Just yeah. a few thoughts. Yeah. Um, so we see in verse eighteen that he went to the spirits and he preached. Uh, so I remember, I don't know who it was, but one of the faculty told that uh, he went down and preached the victory of the cross. Uh, so I hope that I understood that correctly. But why was uh, baptism and uh, the story of Noah is is together uh, over here? Is is my question. And I also want to know if there's any other uh, thing that happened when he went to the spirit and preached. Thank you, uh, Jeffina. So here, going to the spirits and preaching. In fact, I think we'll come back to uh, the spirits in the prison later on. Also, Peter will make more reference. At that time, we can go into uh, more in depth. But right now. what we can say is uh, i think it's there again in the book of ephesians where you know jesus went down to hades so hades at that point uh, is a term used where you had both the righteous and the unrighteous uh, uh, waiting in the hades so once jesus died he goes down to hades and he basically proclaims so preaching to the spirits doesn't mean for the sake of salvation it's not that it just means declaring what he has done so what what did he do he died on the cross and that is the victory so basically he went down to tell the spirits you are now defeated i have finished the work that's it you know uh, so that is the meaning and i hope you got your answer for that and the second part is why the connection between noah and the work of baptism so hmm we save through water i i don't see like a you know log a logical con uh, connection actually so he's just made a mention they were saved through water and uh, then he just goes ahead and he talks about uh, uh water baptism so yeah i i don't think i am able to explain that correctly accurately to you uh, let me also just quickly look at what i have here uh, so it's just uh, i feel like it's not you know how we we uh, we say that that thought um pours into the next thought or you're building up with with uh, um ideas so it's not a build up so when you look at the word there they were saved by water when we uh, understand the term by over there it also has uh, a meaning of it says save through water and also like after water so after the flood they were safe because of the ark 
okay and that ark is a picture of uh, salvation because they were saved now that he's talking about water it's kind of not exactly a connected thought he suddenly goes to baptism yeah so there is no connecting or building uh, thought there but i'll look up little more and uh, you know validate what i'm saying yeah good questions thank you jafina any other questions so sure. so if uh, we are done we could just pray and uh, wrap up i would again like to request one of us to kindly uh, uh, pray Let's pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. I thank you for this day. Thank you for the class that we had. And we thank you for everything uh, that we learned. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you uh, for everything that you have did, Jesus, for us. Uh, we thank you for the new revelations and new understanding that you have given us through the class. Help us to learn more about you and to glorify you more on this life. We thank you for Pastor Nancy and I thank you for all my classmates. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jafina. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Please I... do take care. Please. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, brother. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you.